Madam Chair, Council Members, and Participants, we are now live. Fantastic. Thank you. I understand that state law currently requires that the following announcement be made at the beginning of every remote public hearing as follows. Due to the current public health emergency, City Council committees are currently meeting remotely. We are using Microsoft Teams to make these remote hearings possible. Instructions for how the public may view and offer public testimony at public hearings of council committees are included in the public notices in the public notices that are published in the Daily News, Inquirer, and Legal Intelligence here prior to the hearings and can also be found on phlcouncil.com. I now know that the hour has, cur has come, and Madam Clerk, will you please call the roll call to take attendance? Members that are in attendance will please indicate that you are present when your name is called. Also, please say a few brief remarks when responding so that your image will be displayed on screen when you speak. Madam Clerk? Council Member Heenan. Council Member O. Good morning, Chairwoman. Good morning, colleagues. Good morning, public. Good morning. Council Member Gim. Good morning, Madam Chair. Good morning to my colleagues. Good morning. Good afternoon, I should Good say. Afternoon. Sorry. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Same thing in our world. It all runs together. <laughs> Council Member Green. Good afternoon, Madam Chair. Good afternoon, Councilman. Councilmember Thomas. Good afternoon, Madam Chair. Good afternoon, colleagues. And of course, thank you, Madam Chair, for allowing us to convene to have this important conversation. We appreciate your leadership. Thank you, Councilman. Councilmember Brooks. Good afternoon, Madam Chair. Good afternoon, colleagues. And I'm excited to be a part of this hearing today. Good afternoon. And we also have Council Member Jones in attendance. Thank you for having me, Madam Chair, for this Thank you for very important topic. Thank you for being here, Councilman. We appreciate your presence. A quorum of the committee is present and the hearing is now called to order. This is the public hearing of the Committee on Public Health and Human Services regarding resolution number 200338. Madam Clerk, will you please read the title of the resolution? A resolution authorizing City Council's Committee on Public Health and Human Services to hold hearings regarding the disproportionate numbers of seniors in congregate care settings who have passed away as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic. Before we begin to hear testimony from the witnesses uh, that we have here today, everyone who has been invited to the meeting to testify should be aware that this public hearing is being recorded. Because the hearing is public, participants and viewers have no reasonable expectation of privacy. By continuing to be in the meeting, you are consenting to being recorded. Additionally, prior to recognizing members for the questions or comments that they have for witnesses, I will note for the record at this time that we will use the chat feature available in Microsoft Teams to allow members to signify that they wish to be recognized. In order to comply with the Sunshine Act, the chat feature must only be used for this purpose. And Madam Clerk, will you now please call the first panel of witnesses that we have to testify this afternoon? Um, Council Member Jones, did you want to be recognized for a statement? You're a mute, Kurt. Councilman Jones, you're a mute. I would defer to uh, the chairwoman's wishes to bring the panel up, but I would like to be recognized at a later date because this topic is very germane to my district. Councilman, if it's okay with you, I'd like to call the panel forward. And if Councilman Thomas as the sponsor has a question, and then uh, uh, if you wanted to, um, has a question or comment, and then if you would like to make a question or comment uh, going forward, is that okay with you? Thank you for your indulgence, Madam Chair. Abs absolutely. All right. Uh, first witness is Dr. Thomas Farley, Health Commissioner of the Department of Public Health. 
All right, uh, shall I start? Good afternoon, please state your name for the record uh, and then proceed with your testimony. All right, good afternoon, Chair Member Bass and members of the Public Health and Human Services Committee. I'm Dr. Thomas Farley, the Commissioner of the Department of Public Health. Thank you for allowing me to testify in resolution 200338 regarding the disproportionate number of seniors in congregate care settings who have passed away as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic. Congregate care facilities are at very high risk for the spread of COVID-19 because of the concentration of very vulnerable elderly persons indoors and the close contact between staff members and residents. Once the COVID-19 is introduced into these facilities, it can spread quickly from one resident to others. In Philadelphia and in the United States as a whole, the COVID-19 pandemic struck congregate care facilities very hard. In Philadelphia, there are 47 skilled nursing facilities, typically referred to as nursing homes, and 66 personal care homes and assisted living facilities. In the spring of 2020, all 47 skilled nursing facilities had outbreaks of COVID-19 with over 3,300 COVID-19 cases in residents. Approximately 27% of these residents died Personal care homes and assisted living facilities were affected to a lesser extent with 125 resident cases of COVID-19 and 24 deaths reported. In many facilities, the introduction of COVID-19 was from an infected staff member, many of whom had, symptom, had no symptoms of their infection. The Department of Public Health does not fund or regulate these congregate care facilities. However, we have supported these facilities since March by designating response teams for each site that offer outbreak management support, infection prevention and control guidance, COVID-19 testing, and personal protective equipment. In a couple of instances, we have provided staffing support through the Medical Reserve Corps. In addition to frequent and ongoing guidance by phone, our infection prevention experts have, a con have conducted site visits <clears throat> to assess infection control practices in 43 separate long-term care facilities and six personal care homes. We recognize though that these facilities need additional support during this pandemic. In June, 2020, the Health Department partnered with the University of Pennsylvania Health System to support a small number of long-term care facilities to contain their COVID-19 outbreaks. Then in July, the Pennsylvania Department of Human Services funded the University of Pennsylvania Health System, the Jefferson Health System, and Temple University Health System to provide similar support to all congregate care facilities in the region through what is called the Regional Response Health Collaboration Program. With this additional support, we believe the congregate care facilities now have much stronger infection control practices and are in a better position to limit the spread of COVID-19 virus. The health department has collaborated with these hospital-based support teams on site visits, weekly coordination meetings, creation of an infection prevention educational toolkit, and providing influenza vaccination. Mm -hmm. We have taken additional steps to strengthen the facility's defenses against this virus for the coming fall and winter wave of COVID-19. Two key steps are defining minimum requirements that facilities must meet to care for residents with COVID-19, and then creating the Philadelphia COVID-19 Relief Unit, a specialized facility that can care for residents with COVID-19 if the facilities cannot meet these requirements. We hope that by separating residents who have COVID-19 from those who do not, we will reduce the spread of the virus within facilities. In addition, the COVID-19 relief unit may also serve to decompress an acute care facilities this fall and winter if they become full because of patients with COVID-19. As we approach this dangerous period, we will continue to work with the congregate care facilities and we'll work closely with the health system support teams as long as they're funded and operational. I'd be happy to answer any of your questions. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, Councilman Thomas. Thank you, Madam Chair. I appreciate it. Um, and thank you to uh, um, Dr. Farley. We appreciate your leadership and your support on this matter. Um, I think when I first introduced the resolution, um, we were in the midst of the uh, pandemic as it relates to the spring and summertime. And the timing of the hearing, um, unfortunately, couldn't be better because this week, We've seen um, rising cases um, like no other. Uh, the hearing today um, is about specifically nursing homes, but I'm wondering if you could start by just telling us a little bit about the spiking cases that we're in the midst of right now and the correlation between the spiking cases that we're seeing and what we've seen earlier as it relates to the spread in nursing homes. Right, so we are seeing a very rapid rise in cases right now. Uh, it is growing exponentially, and people often use that term incorrectly, but this is truly exponential spread. That means that if it case rates double, uh, daily case counts double over 14 days, then they'll double again over the next 14 days. Uh, we're already at the highest uh, daily case counts we've seen in the entire epidemic. 
so I'm very concerned about the epidemic's effect on the city as a whole. And then I'm very effect, uh, very concerned about the effect on uh, these congregate care facilities, nursing homes particularly, especially because we saw how hard they were hit in the spring. Uh, we are, uh, no question of that we are much better prepared now than we were in the spring and that the nursing homes individually and both us as a system, uh, that they've, they've got PPE, they've trained their staff on how to uh, do things, the staff are, are careful. And we have these regional, um, uh, the RRCHP, I forget exactly the, the word that I said in the testimony, but the support from the health systems to the uh, nursing homes, uh, I think that that is uh, crucial support. Uh, and, and I'm very appreciative of all those health systems providing that support. Nonetheless, even with all that, I'm worried, uh, but I feel like we've done everything we could to try to uh, protect them for this wave. Thank you. And so uh, when we're seeing the increase in numbers, um, again, I know specifically right now we're talking about nursing homes. Are, are, are they, are the, is the spread that we're watching right now, does any of it have to do with nursing homes? So, and I know you talked about this in press conferences, but I'm trying to get it on the record for the purposes of today's hearing. Um, why are we seeing a spread right now? Where are the um, places that we're seeing a lot of confirmed cases? Again, earlier in the year, we knew that a big part of the spread was because of what was taking place in nursing homes and healthcare facilities. Is that the case now, or is there something else that is seeing the, the, the number of confirmed cases grow as rapidly as you said? Yeah, so it appears that um, the coronavirus is following the same pattern of other respiratory viruses like influenza. Each year, influenza gets uh, starts out slowly in the fall, and then it rises throughout the fall, and it peaks around January, February, and then it tends to subside in the spring. Uh, there's something about the winter weather uh, that makes it easier for these viruses to spread. Uh, we don't know if it's just because people are inside more, because it's colder, because the air is drier, uh, but what, for whatever reason, those viruses are worse. So, so behavior and situations that were safe a couple of months ago are no longer safe. As for where it's spreading, this virus is spreading right now a little bit everywhere. Um, a lot in um, so, small social gatherings, just a few people get together, in somebody's house, uh, to parties, and a large number of people in somebody's house, people go out to restaurants. It's spreading in office uh, workplaces when people uh, get together over lunch and they don't wear their masks. The, uh, we have definitely seen cases in nursing homes uh, on this wave, but they've been relatively small and relatively contained so far. So the nursing homes are not the cause of the epidemic wave at this point by any means, uh, but I'm worried that they will uh, we, we know that COVID will be introduced into those nursing homes uh, by the staff, if nothing else. Um, and uh, and so we're doing everything we can to try to protect it so that if, if it's introduced, it doesn't spread to residents. Thank you, Dr. Farley. Just a few more things real quick. Um, you talked about the, the regional, I think you called it the Regional Response Health Program, or RHP. So yeah. uh, I'm assuming that that program, um, a lot of the funding for it comes from CARES dollars. Is that correct? Yeah, it's, it's funded, uh, it's federal dollars that go to the state and from the state to these health systems. And let me just say right now, those dollars uh, and the CARES Act expire on December 31st. Uh, and so I'm very concerned what happens uh, after that. And we have been advocating uh, very strenuously with the state to try to figure out a way to extend the, the funding of this into the new year. So you already answered the, the, the follow-up question. So thank you for that. I assume you knew where I was going with that. That's in a very important matter that I definitely wanted to get on the record. And um, I know that myself, along with a lot of my colleagues in council, stand with you as it relates to advocating for that federal support. So programs like that and other programs that we have in place to stop the spread can continue to exist. Um, the last question I have, and then I'll pass it back to um, uh, the, uh, our chairwoman. Um, when do you think we will be communicating new guidelines? We are, like you said, this week has been the worst week we've seen so far. I'm pretty sure knowing you and your team and the, and the administration, you all are probably huddling and talking about uh, what we need to do to stop the spread and flatten the curve. Um, when can we anticipate an announcement from the health department as it relates to the direction the city is going to go in uh, as we fight this virus this winter? We will be announcing new restrictions on Monday. Oh, Brother Jamal. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Farley. Thank you, Madam Chair. I appreciate it. And, and, and again, thank you, Dr. Farley, for being here today to communicate this, um, and, and the, the, some important information about an important issue. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member. Thank you, Councilman. And thank you, uh, Commissioner. Uh, Councilman Jones. Thank you, Madam Chair. And thank you, Member Thomas, for introducing this so important resolution. 
Um, and I want to say thank you. Um, we don't have Bouchy, but we do have a Farley in Philadelphia. Uh, and if I had to go into such dangerous times of this pandemic, I am, I am thankful that we have you at the head of our health department that is led by science and not by fears or not by uh, uh, false uh, promises of a better day, but dealing with the hard truths and the hard facts. And I'm, I mean that. Um, I watch your daily briefings and I am encouraged about whatever you bring forward because I know it's, it, it's the truth. And sometimes it's the hard truth. So thank you and your staff. Thank um, you, John. And, and Madam Chair, I, 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 I was compelled to be on this because um, those who are at large members know, but also people who share similar um, demographics like you know how hard it was early on um, in this pandemic dealing with our senior centers. A lot of the prisons got a lot of the attention because they were, quote, a captured audience and people rallied, the power rallied and churches rallied to get the prison population reduced. But our, our, our most vulnerable seniors had no place to go. And what I found out in the early part of it, um, I, was, I started getting calls, Madam Chair, uh, 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 from workers that worked at these facilities. And they said, first and foremost, they didn't have PPEs. Secondly, some of them were getting sick and were bringing that to the attention of management. And they said, well, well, yeah, come in anyway. Some of these facilities had wards that had residents that had dementia. So they don't know what's going on with their health. And some of the care that they were receiving was a little sketchy to say the best. And I'm being, I'm being polite. Dr. Farley uh, got on a group with a unintended consequence was that all of the homes in my area. So if you stand on the parking lot of Target and throw a rock, you're going to hit 5,000 people in assisted living facilities. Um, some of the places are uh, Brif Shalom, Caresley House, Hayes Manor, Park Tower, the Pavilion, Ivy Residence, the Wynn Place, um, Bala Nursing Home, uh, Belmont Behavioral Health, Simpson House, English House, and Opportunity Towers. You mentioned 24 deaths. Most of them were in those areas. But to our doctor's credit, when we got these folks together, along with PCOM, to start to talk about this, and we talked about the lack of PPEs, I want to tell you, the next day, an ambulance full of PPEs arrived based on Dr. Uh, Farley's effort to assist those workers. I couldn't have, I mean, number 45 up in the White House wasn't coming over a hill riding a white horse, but our doctor, our health commissioner, did that. This is something I saw him do. What has happened since then uh, is people have put into place, they were trying to build a plane, Madam Chair, and fly it at the same time and land it. There was no playbook for this pandemic. And I am just thankful um, to say, even with the deaths that we had, even with the um, problems with labor and management, that we had, that because of his leadership, it could have been worse. I was looking at reports from other counties where they were bringing in the National Guard to assist in, in what, what could only be called as a mass unit, dealing with some of this, these problems. So he's very modest and humble but I don't have to be for you. And I don't have to be for your staff. And when um, member Thomas said he was going to have this hearing and um, uh, Chairwoman Bass decided to do it, 
I wanted that story on the record. And thank you. So now we've evolved to, we're giving um, senior citizens with the help of University of PCOM and, and University of Penn flu shots with your assistance, with your staff's assistance, so that we can minimize some of this second wave. So all I wanted to do was say thank you and have it on the record. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you very much, Council Member. If I could say, I want to acknowledge my colleagues at the Office of Emergency Management. They're really the ones who procured all that PPE and had it in storage. And they said, where does it need to go? And we said, okay, here's where we need to go. So they're the ones who really delivered it and did the, the hard work on that. I thank them too, but I called you. Thank you, Council Member. Thank you, Madam Chair. You're very welcome. And I want to echo that thanks because um, I think that it's under Dr. Farley's leadership that we've had, um, you know, uh, we, we, we didn't turn into the, um, the hot zone that some of those uh, uh, folks in Washington said that Philadelphia would be next. I remember that. And, you know, they said that and, and, and you know, um, there were other folks who were just sort of watching and waiting what we did. And this is a perfect example of where Philadelphians and particularly our health department, OEM, our first responders, everyone rose to the occasion and said that, you know, we want to get in front of this thing as much as possible. And so, and I guess the, the question going forward is, as we see round two of COVID happening, you know, how do we make sure that we get in front of it with lessons learned so that we never have to relive some of these things again? Um, I did just get an alert on my phone, um, Dr. Farley, that there's going to be a press briefing Monday, November 16th at 1 um, to announce new COVID restrictions in response to the recent rise in new cases. Um, and I just wanted to see if you want to make any announcements today before we... <laughs> Uh, that, that is enough. Feel, feel uh, free. Feel free. Restrictions. I will say this: that still, no matter what we talk about as far as restrictions, most of this is spread in private gatherings and private settings. So the individual yes. behavior of individual Philadelphia residents still has to change. And what I started saying today is: think how you behaved in late March and early April during the lockdown. That's how you ought to behave right now. Yes. Absolutely. Thank you, Dr. Farley. Uh, Councilman Green had a question, and then we're going to circle back to Council Member, uh, Councilman Thomas. All right. Thank you. Councilman thank Green. You. Uh, Dr. Farley, thank you for your leadership uh, on this issue. I want to thank my colleague, Councilman Isaiah Thomas, for holding this hearing. Uh, I actually had a staff member who lost uh, her mother her side in the early part of this pandemic. Uh, so this is a very um, important conversation, uh, and I want to see Dr. Farley his perspective on um, what steps we should be giving guidance to um, our staff going into the holiday season. Um, and Count Councilman, we're ha we're having a very difficult time hearing you. Okay, I'll I'll, I'll try to. Uh, just a little bit, um, but quickly, um, Dr. Farley, what guidance would you give for constituents going into the holiday season in reference to visiting relatives who may be in contact care, whether they should or should not do that um, because of the spike and increase in COVID and how do we try to maintain and keep senior pain? Yeah, you know, the upcoming holidays is going to be a tough time for everybody. Uh, that's a wonderful time of the year ordinarily where we get together and express our love for the people that we care so much about uh, and everybody wants to do that again this year and I've had to say you shouldn't do that this year uh, so I we're saying if you want to celebrate Thanksgiving or other holidays do it with your immediate household members only uh, so don't invite your relatives over to your house or don't go to their house for the holidays same rule goes for uh, visiting relatives in congregate care you know I, I hate to say it but you know uh, you're gonna have to Express your love over Zoom. Uh, it's just, it's too dangerous right now. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Councilman. Councilman Thomas. Yes, briefly, I just wanted yes, to, briefly, in the spirit yes, of my colleague, yes, Councilman yes, Jones and um, yes, Councilman yes, Green, as well as yes, Councilman yes, Bash, just also uh, communicate my support for the health department. Um, everybody knows I'm a big sports person. I still coach high school basketball. And the health department um, really, um, 
made themselves readily available uh, just to put it out there for the record. We had a number of different listening sessions with sports providers uh, throughout the city so that we can make sure that they were up to breast as it relates to the guidelines and restrictions um, for um, participating in physical activity. And I think that, again, that's another example of how um, Dr. Farley and his team stepped up to the plate, uh, stepped outside of their norm and put us in a position to make sure that people were safe. So um, I just wanted to throw that out there. Before we let you go, Dr. Farley, real quick, can you just talk to us a little bit about the contact tracing that took place? The last time we had a conversation with you, we didn't really get a chance to dive into contact tracing because we still had too many confirmed daily cases. So um, I don't believe we've heard from you since contact tracing. Can you just talk a little bit about how contact tracing is going and um, what we can do to support you as it relates to that initiative. And I promise you, Madam Chair, I'm done after that. Yeah, so, you know, the contact tracing is part of a larger containment effort where you try to identify individual cases and then quickly uh, see who they may have exposed and then have those contacts that they might have exposed go into quarantine so the virus doesn't spread any further. Um, we are in a ability able to handle maybe 150 or maybe 200 cases a day with our contact tracing staff, uh, but we're now averaging about 700 cases a day. Uh, and so just the system is completely overwhelmed with the cases we're having. And so the contact tracing system is not uh, effective right now in addressing the epidemic, which is why we're gonna have to put in place these restrictions that we'll talk about on Monday. Now, um, so we are going to be uh, providing written guidance to people that internally we're calling right now, trace your own contacts of what you should do if you are positive so that uh, we don't need to guide you individually because we can't, don't have the staff time to do that. And then we will at some point be on the other side of this epidemic wave. And as case counts start to go down again, then contact tracing will take on much greater importance again. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Uh, thank you, Commissioner. Uh, Councilman Thomas, uh, any other additional questions? You can ask as many questions as you like. <laughs> no, Madam Chair, thank you so much. I appreciate it. I'm pretty sure Dr. Farley uh, <laughs> doesn't want to sit here and answer uh, a ton of questions. Um, but we do appreciate, again, your leadership, your guidance, your support in uh, fighting this coronavirus plague. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. And thank you again to you, Dr. Farley, for all that you've done. And we know it's been a trying uh, few months here, uh, but um, we, we appreciate you and we want you to know we might not always say it, but we really do have a great amount of respect and appreciation for you. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you. Right. Absolutely. So Madam I'm, Clerk, can we have yes. say again? Say again, Commissioner. Just be clear that I can I can leave the meeting now. You can, but you're more than welcome to stay. <laughs> as long as you like. <laughs> I will take my leave, but I uh, hope you have a great day. All right. Thank you so much, Commissioner, for joining us today. Okay. Uh, Madam Clerk, can we have you call the next panel forward? Um, Nelson Jones of the Summerton Center Nursing Home. Okay. Hello, can y'all hear me? Uh, yes, uh, can we, uh, um, Nelson Jones, can you pause for one moment? Uh, Madam Clerk, can we have you call the next three folks on the panel so that they can be in queue so that after Nelson Jones speaks, we can move to the next two after them? Yes. Um, Julie Moore from the SEIU Healthcare Pennsylvania, Thomas Norderman, and Dr. Nino O'Connor of Penn Medicine. Okay, in that order. Okay, uh, and up first we have Nelson Jones from Summerton Center Nursing Home. Uh, hello, my name is Nelson Jones. I'm a cook at Summerton Center Nursing Home in Northeast Philadelphia. Thank you for inviting me here to speak today. My job is an important one, cooking food for people I care about. I have a long history of doing it and I'm good at it. I've been at Summerton for almost 10 years. And in the last few years, we've been brought and sold twice. I'm sure you can imagine the shakeup that caused, not just for the workers like me, but for the residents who call Summerton home. Each new company that came in caused more trouble than the last. When I started at Summerton, we were owned by Genesis. With Genesis, we could at least say we felt respected for the job we did and the care we delivered. No one takes a job caring for the elderly to get rich, 
but we could at least make a living and they invested in training for everyone. Then a few years ago, a company called Vita Healthcare from New Jersey bought the building and voided our contract. We negotiated with them for more than a year and it was just take, take, take. They cut our wages to the bone, took away our vacation time and made our healthcare too expensive for almost anyone. They made it clear what was important to them. It was not how to best take care of residents, not how they could respect and support the caregivers. They only cared about how could they take more money out of summoning. They only cared about the bottom line. It took us a year to negotiate a new contract. But we finally settled on a contract with them. It wasn't a contract we wanted, but it was one we were willing to live with so we could get back to caring for our residents. Then, not even six months by, we were sold again. This time to Imperial, another New Jersey company. But it was the same story. Everything we had just fought for for a year was thrown out and we were back where we started with another owner who only cared about the bottom line. I worry what they say about us, that we can just sell their homes to those out-of-state corporations and no one looks into their intentions. No one vet them to see if they want to help care for the residents or just find a way to take money out of our community. After all we've been through with the coronavirus and all we're going to have to go through as the numbers keep rising, this is the worst possible thing we can do to the people who need us most. The main thing, we should be looking at these companies with a magnifying glass. We should be inspecting their records carefully and holding public hearings so they have to answer to the community before they can move in here and take over. I'm here today to ask you to protect those people. They are vulnerable people. They are our mothers and fathers, our brothers and sisters, our friends and neighbors. They need our help and we are letting them down. They deserve better. Our community deserve better. I'm asking you now to make a commitment to do better and make sure we protect those who need it the most. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for your testimony. And I have to say it's really moving. Um, you know, you're doing the work uh, to, to take care of folks that uh, can't take care of themselves. And I just really want to say thank you. I mean, my heart really means it means every word of it. Thank you for all that you're doing, because uh, but for the grace of God, there go any one of us and um, the work that you're doing, making sure that people have good, nutritious food, you know, and caring for, for folks. Um, you know, it, it, it just it, I, I can't even put it into words, um, the work that you're doing and how very, very, very important it is. So I just want to say thank you for all that you're doing. Um, Councilman Thomas. I just want to echo your sentiments, Madam Chair, and I'm not going to go into questions until we get through the whole panel. I know that there's one okay. person who has to uh, leave at one o'clock that's on this particular panel. So once we go through okay. the panel, I'll come back and ask questions for this panel. But thank you. Okay. 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 I didn't, thank you, Mr. I, Jones, for your testimony. Thank you. I didn't know if you had a question now. I saw I was, I'm, I'm probably reading an old uh, request for a comment, so I apologize. Okay. Thank you so much. And the uh, next panelist to testify, please state your name for the record and begin your testimony. Hi, Julie Moore. Good, good afternoon, Julie Moore. Please state your name for the record again and begin your testimony. Hi, my name is Julie Moore. 
Hello, guys, and um, thank you all for having me today. I'm Julie Moore, Nursing Home CNA, here in the city of Philadelphia. I am also a leader in my union, SEIU, Healthcare Pennsylvania, and served as a member political organizer over the past several weeks. I have been a caregiver for many years, but never in my life experienced anything like COVID-19. Nursing homes are being called ground zero for pandemic deaths in this country. And I'm here to tell you that it is accurate. It's very accurate. Everyone who works in a nursing home knows they will deal with death. It comes with a job. That doesn't mean it's easy. I do this job because I love caring for people. My residents are my family. Every day I go to work, I want to bring a smile to their face, care for them, and comfort them. Comfort them is a job we take very seriously every day. You can ask anyone who works in a nursing home. We do not let people die alone. We will sit in a resident's room, hold their hand, and be with them for as long as it takes until they pass, and I've done that many times. COVID, however, has changed that. It was impossible to keep up with the deaths when COVID swept through my building. I once lost like maybe I'm saying 10 residents in a day in one shift. And that imagine that, imagine coming in and seeing people just dying and ambulances coming inside the building every, every few hours. Um, and, and the residents that we see every day are dying. My coworkers and I were putting in 16 hour days watching those we care for suffer and die. There was no time to mourn, no time to rest. It's very unacceptable and we cannot let this happen again. The long-term care industry needs to change. The problems we saw beginning in March didn't come out of nowhere. For years, nursing home workers like me have sounded the alarm on inadequate staffing and poor conditions. People come to work at this job and then leave quickly because of poverty wages and lack of respect. The pandemic threw all of these problems onto a national stage. Nursing home workers, nursing home owners must be held accountable to providing PPE. There was many days that my coworkers and I had to dress in trash bags and spray our hands and, and, and shoes with bleach that we brought from home because there were no gloves and there were no um, PP, proper PPE. And the, the owners um, treat, treating their caregivers with respect and paying them a living wage. Workers should not have to beg their manager for basic protective equipment. These managers in my building were hiding and hoarding PPE that they did have in the basement during this pandemic. And we need to go to the media when these conditions get this bad. These are businesses operating within Philadelphia in charge of caring for the most vulnerable citizens of our city. As the city council of Philadelphia, you should be holding them accountable to being a good employer that treats its workers well and providing the care that every resident needs and deserves. COVID numbers are on the rise again. We must never, ever go back to the way things were. Thank you. Thank you, Julie. Thank you so much for your testimony. Um, and I, I really do appreciate all of the work that you're doing with SEIU, all of the work that they've been doing, um, just making sure that workers are protected, which protects the public, which protects the patient, which protects all of us, those who uh, need assistance in nursing homes, those who are not uh, need, uh, in need of assistance. Um, but SEIU has certainly done their part and then some, and we want to say thank you. Okay. Um, next person to testify. Thank you. Our next panelist to testify. I believe it was Judy Martin. Good afternoon. This game Good afternoon. The city Council. Good afternoon. Please state your name for the record and begin with your testimony. My name is Judy Martin and I am a certified nurse and assistant in a long, long term care facility. I am also a member of District 1199C, National Union of Hospital and Healthcare Employees, asked me. I sit before you today to discuss the very serious COVID-19 crisis taking place in long-term care facilities here in Pennsylvania and throughout America. Our city must be prepared for the next major health crisis and that preparation must start early. I have worked 
as a CNA for 31 years. This year has been the most difficult and stressful by far. Across the Commonwealth, more than 4,700 long-term care residents died from COVID-19 between the beginning of the outbreak and August. 68% of all deaths to that point. Though we have fallen into a, re a relative low in the number of cases and deaths in Philadelphia, cases are now back on the rise. The city reported 761 new cases on Wednesday, 11th of November, bringing the number of cases above a grim milestone of 50,000. Yesterday, for the first time, PA reported for the first time 5,000 cases. Philadelphia has now seen 1,904 deaths from COVID-19, 918 of those deaths, nearly 50%, have occurred in long-term care facilities. Nationwide, the situation is no better. Cases are rising to all-time highs, and hospitals are running out of beds in states like Texas, Massachusetts, and Michigan. At the beginning of this pandemic, I often felt like I was working in a war. I know I speak for many of my colleagues when I say that the physical and mental stress was extremely difficult to bear. Though things have now improved as we have gotten a better handle on the logistics, every day is still a new challenge. Residents cannot see their families regularly, which has a very, diff a, a very negative effect on mental health. Though we work in full PPE, there is still always a risk that we could pick up the virus somewhere else, bring it into our homes and affect our families. Leaving our home carriers inherit risk. Mental health is challenging for care workers too. Though things have improved as my employer and others have brought in counselors. I think there are a couple of key matters where the city can and should step in to help further improve conditions in long-term care facilities. First, the city needs to ensure that long-term care facility staff are provided with at least two weeks six pay, expanded hazard pay, sufficient training, PPE, and continued access to mental health counseling. These are crucial support systems that allow my colleagues and I to continue doing our job to the best of our ability every day. Second, the city needs to invest resources into an educational campaign in advance of our vaccine coming available in 2021. Frontline workers in healthcare facilities will likely be some of the first to receive a vaccine and distribution begins. Personally, I have some questions about the distribution process and the safety of this vaccine. And I know for sure that I am not alone. Though leaders of Operation Warp Speed, the federal government's vaccine program, have expressed optimism on delivering the vaccine to states, it will be up to the state and local officials to run that program here. I want to make sure that everyone is on the same page when it comes to vaccine vaccination programs because it's a matter of life and death. While things have certainly improved, there is still progress to be made to ensure that long-term care facilities are safe and secure for residents, staff, and others. I know the city has our back though these last months, but we need your support to continue doing our job safely and effectively. Things have certainly not always been perfect, but we are making progress. In all likelihood, another global pandemic will hit us one day, but we can rest easy knowing that we prepared early, invested the proper funding, and provided the best guidance and information possible. I thank you all for your time, and I look forward 
to speak in further with you individually in the coming days, weeks, and months. Thank you very much. Well, I want to thank you for your testimony. I, you know, I, uh, I think that this is a council that has done uh, a lot to try to uh, make sure that workers are protected. But I think your your statement uh, really hits it home, which is what more needs to be done, and what more can we do to be helpful to you? Um, and, and as you you're the expert because you all are on the ground doing the work, uh, we'll, we're going to take our cues from you in terms of moving forward and what needs to be done. So I, I really thank you and all of the panelists for all of the work that you all are doing. You are really and truly the front line putting uh, yourselves and your families uh, in, in harm's way, in risk as well, to make sure that other people are, are taken care of. So again, many, many thanks. Much love to you. Uh, Councilman Thomas. Thank you, Madam Chair, and of course, thank you to all the witnesses who, test witnesses who testified. I appreciate your service. I appreciate you putting your life on the line. Um, I had a chance to uh, be at a press conference, and they said that everybody's being called essential workers now, uh, but you are the only ones who are considered contact workers because you're actually forced to come in contact with the virus. And whoever said that this was a war, I think you're absolutely right. Um, Ms. Ms. Martin talked a little bit about the mental health side, and I did document all your suggestions, Ms. Martin, and I want to be honest with you. I wish we could do something about it, a lot of the things you said, but a lot of those things will require our state partners um, where, where we could step up to the plate and provide uh, paid sick leave and other support initiatives. We tried our best to step up to the plate. And uh, like you said, it definitely was not good enough. But with that being said, uh, Ms. Martin, you talked a little bit about mental health support. Um, I would love to hear what mental health support did or did not take place for employees. Uh, Mr. Jones, you can answer that question. Uh, Ms. Moore, you can answer that question. I, I'm not, it doesn't matter who answers it, but if you could briefly talk about the mental health support that you got or did not get in the midst of all the trauma that took place um, dealing with this coronavirus pandemic. I listened to one person testify saying that they um, seen about 10 deaths um, in a short amount of time. And I can only imagine the trauma um, that that was to experience that. So if, 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 if any, either one of the other uh, panelists can talk about uh, the mental health support that was either there or not there um, throughout the midst of this pandemic, that would definitely be appreciated. Hi, yes, um, I'm Julie Moore. Um, I work at the Care Pavilion in Philadelphia, and I said that um, about the 10 deaths. Um, as far as the mental health side, I didn't receive any um, type of therapy or, or got a chance to talk to anybody because I was on autopilot uh, the entire time. Um, you know, you just, you just didn't have, it was like a, it was almost similar to like a fight or flight instinct. And, um, I chose, I had the option, I have two children. I chose, I had the option to stay home with them, but for some reason, I, I just felt compelled to stay inside the building as a union delegate and a union leader, because I saw how unfairly my coworkers were being treated by the owners and the management. And, um, I just felt compelled to stay there to try to fight for all of us and, and also the residents, because a lot of residents that like CNAs, you know, people put us on the bottom of the food chain because we don't have all the degrees, but we are with the patient more than anybody in the building. And um, so when we would notice a change in the residents, um, you know, behavior and because COVID, you know, when, when they were broadcasting it on television about like the main symptoms, COVID-19 is, COVID is much more than that. Like there's a, there's a million symptoms <laughs> other than the main ones. So when we would see a, a change in, in me even mental status with the patient, um, you know, it was almost, almost like it was being ignored. And so then going home and then coming back the next day is, see that you know mrs smith is 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 five minutes away from passing away and then her roommate is too and now the guy down the hall is and then somebody on the other side is that was overwhelming and these people were looking at us and asking us am i going to die from this and we didn't know what to say so every night you know i would come home and i would have to undress on the porch you know with things underneath my clothes and put them in the trash bags because i like my daughter had respiratory dis uh, issues and i didn't want to get them sick and it was just unbelievably unbelievably just 
disgusted how we were treated by management. We had to fight to get a new mask and, and we were scared to death. So, you know, I, you know, I didn't have time to let the dust settle because, you know, I just had to get up every day and go to work. And then, you know, and, and then that's when I really got a feel for my coworkers because we were all in it together. Like we were all in it together because 70% of the staff were out because they were sick or they had underlying health conditions and they didn't want to put themselves at risk. So we've got uh, uh, three, three, three staff on the floor with with forty residents, and we're just running crazy. You know, we didn't even make the regular assignments of who gets what. We just all kind of work together because the next thing you know, we'd hear that ambulance coming in, and we would all get scared and run to the other units. Like, well, who's next? And then now it's another ambulance, and it was it was it was very very overwhelming. And sometimes I would just, you know, have to go in the bathroom, and I would sit, you know, sit in the bathroom on the floor and just cry because it was very scary. And and it seemed like at that time nobody nobody understood you know nobody understood like what was going on it was nobody to reach out to nobody to talk to and it was it was a, it was a hard time for me and my kids would look at me every day and say mom please don't go to work because they were afraid you know I have asthma they were afraid but I still got up every day and I would layer my clothing and I would go in there and, and I just got the job done so I never got a chance to talk to any anybody but platforms like this and being able to speak out um you know has helped me in ways um and knowing that everybody on this call and um and other organizations care um you know it means a lot to me and it and allows me to know that i'm not alone in this and that you know other people felt the way that i did so i appreciate this well, i was just going to say please know that you're not alone and that we're with you we stand with you we, we we're going to take like i said we take our cues from you direct us and we will uh, follow your lead on this because you're you are on the front line you are on the ground and um the the directives really should come from the folks who are most impacted and 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 know uh, exactly what's going on i'm sorry councilman thomas i just jumped in front of you uh, this was your question no, no i'm 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 just not in my head with you i mean um these are the narratives that we need to hear this is the tough part about our job um but all we can do is commend you and listen to your recommendations. Um, you know, we have all of your recommendations, yes. from the paid sick time, to the hazardous time, to the mental health support, to the training, to the PPE. Um, you know, as a municipality, we can support with the PPE. We tried our best with the, uh, with the, with the two, with the, um, ha with the two weeks pay, but the other things, we're going to need some state partners and federal partners to be able to help us out with some of this stuff. When we're talking about hazardous pay, training requirements, and other initiatives that you feel like need to be mandated in order to keep these safe spaces safe. Um, I'm pretty sure I'll be huddling with my colleagues, um, starting with the yes. chair, um, the bad, our chair of this uh, particular committee yes. to figure out what resolutions and what advocacy we need to make happen to try to push our state and federal partners to address the concerns that you all are communicating today. So please know that your uh, testimony is not falling on deaf ears. And I really, really want to thank you for taking the time to not just share, but to be vulnerable. This stuff is not easy to share at all. And I can only imagine, you know, reliving the trauma that you didn't essentially get support for. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, Councilman. Thank you. Uh, Council Member Brooks, question or comment? Mm, uh, yeah. Yeah, I just want to um, also let Judy, Kathy, and Nelson, you know, I also want to acknowledge um, your statements and acknowledge the work um, that you do at working in nursing homes. I worked in a nursing home for several years as a nursing assistant, um, and I it wasn't during the pandemic. And I remember how bad things were then. And I can only imagine what your experiences were like during this pandemic. So um, I just wanted to let you know, I'm acknowledging the sacrifice that you made during this time. And this also was a sacrifice for your family. Um, and I also want to acknowledge the fact that the paid sick leave legislation we know is ending at the end of the year. Um, and like my colleague said, we're looking to make, to see, um, what happens with the next uh, Families First coronavirus legislation and how we can line up supports for you through that funding because it's gonna take um, state and federal funding for us to ensure that we're able to carry on this, legis this legislation um, through this next wave of the pandemic. Um, and like my council uh, partner, uh, Isaiah Thomas just mentioned that we heard all of your concerns um, and, and council member Bass also said that we're looking to find ways to work with you um, yes. to make sure that this next wave is safe um, or as safe as possible. So, you know, you guys can be um, 
the leaders that you are um, in this pandemic at this time. So thank you. And I just wanted to acknowledge that you you were heard. Thank you, Council Member, Council Member Brooks. Thank you, Councilwoman Gim. Yes, thank you very much, Madam Chair. I also just wanted to add my voice uh, to this panel and just express my gratitude to all of you. Um, for several of you, uh, I know that we there were early town halls and uh, d dialogues that that a number of. Uh, healthcare workers, um, 1199C, among others, conducted with members of council. Um, so it helped a lot to have uh, to hear from all of you. In part, one of the um, laws that came out of that was a first in the nation anti retaliation law that prohibited retaliation against employees who raised concerns about uh, health mandates in the workplace. And so I just wanted to um, share out with this panel again and with your members that uh, Philadelphia, uh, through the time period of a health mandate that's in place, um, has a Department of Labor, has a, a place of recourse if your place of business is not following or abiding by mandates. Um, you can file a complaint with the uh, Department of Labor um, if there's any retaliation taken against you for for having raised these things. So, um, but once again, I just want to thank uh, this panel. Um, we know that there's some serious times in the days and weeks ahead, and we want you to know that we are going to be here listening all the way. Thank you, Councilwoman. And as you mentioned, there's some serious times ahead, but I think we're, we're all in agreement. We're all going to do our part. And um, and I thank you for always being out front on these issues and uh, for your hard work uh, on behalf of all the members of council and for most importantly, um, you know, the, the people. Um, so thank you. Thank you very much. Um, if we could have the clerk call the next panel forward. Dr. Nina O'Connor. Um, Thomas Norderman, Kathy Cubitt, Dr. Phil McCallion, and Nancy Salandra. Okay, and um, why don't we start with Dr. Nina O'Connor from Penn Medicine. Dr. O'Connor? Yes, thank you so much, Chairwoman. Thank you. Uh, oh, thank, you. thank you. Council. Thank you for joining us important hearing. I have really enjoyed actually listening to the previous panel, so thank you for that. Um, my name is Nina O'Connor and I'm the Chief Medical Officer of Penn Medicine at Home and I'm also the clinical lead for the Penn RICB or Regional Response Health Collaborative Program that Dr. Farley spoke of earlier. And it's really been my honor and my privilege during this pandemic to lead Penn Medicine's efforts to support long-term care facilities in the city. So I really appreciate the invitation this afternoon. I think it is a very timely uh, topic today, especially um, throughout these months, almost two thirds of the COVID-19 deaths in Pennsylvania have been in nursing homes. And that doesn't even include the other important types of congregate care settings like assisted living and personal care homes or residential treatment facilities. So this is a, a, a critical topic for, uh, for health and also for, for just humanity. So I'm glad we're talking yes. about this. So why is COVID-19 so disproportionately affecting our congregate care settings? There, there are some factors that we can't change. Residents live in very close proximity. They need a lot of personal care. And the residents also have multiple medical conditions. So once COVID-19 gets into a facility, there's a greater risk that the patients will have um, complications or do poorly with COVID-19. But there are some factors that we really struggled with in the spring that are starting to get better. And Dr. Farley mentioned some of these. These are things like PPE and testing and making sure that the staff are equipped with all the right information and knowledge and support that they need to be safe. So we are making some headway. You know, I think our long-term care partners also face some other challenges. They are um, financially burdened by the pandemic and everything that is related to testing sure. and supplies. That's a real challenge. And 
I think the residents are also challenged by the isolation that this has imposed. And so there's so many things that are difficult about this. From, from Penn Medicine, uh, we started working with our facilities on a voluntary basis in the spring. Um, I think Dr. Farley mentioned this. We reached out to the Philadelphia Department of Public Health because we were seeing residents from long-term care coming in large numbers to our emergency departments. And we wanted to be more proactive, not wait until they were coming to the hospital, but instead go out into the community and understand what was happening. So I personally went on site along with the team from Penn and members of the health department to the 10 nursing homes in West Philadelphia. And we, we did a combination of a listening tour to understand what the challenges were. And then for each nursing home, we put together a plan with whatever resources we could put together uh, for that nursing home. Sometimes they needed PPE, sometimes they needed help with testing, sometimes they needed bereavement care for their staff. Sometimes they needed staff recognition. We put together lunches and other ways to just really celebrate the heroes in long-term care. Um, and it was, a, it was a very powerful experience for us as a health system and for me personally, but we learned a lot about what it takes for a nursing home or a long-term care facility to really battle COVID-19. And then uh, in July, the state created the Regional Response Health Collaborative which is a program which matches long-term care facilities with, an, with a health system partner as their go-to resource for COVID-19. It's been incredibly impactful. Penn Medicine is in partnership with Temple Health. We work together for this and we have 313 nursing homes, assisted living facilities, personal care homes, treatment facilities that we support through the pandemic. And we provide a lot of different services. We provide them with tangible resources like access to a lab, help with the testing costs, swabbing. We help them with PPE. Um, we help them with all sorts of resources. And then if there is an outbreak, they can call us or sometimes the health department lets us know and we reach out to them and we offer them support. We can go on site and bring physicians and nurses and social workers. We can help them test everybody in their building, which can be very overwhelming to do. And then we stay alongside them as partners, keeping in touch with them every day or two during the outbreak to see what they need. And if they, if they have questions or if they need extra support. Sometimes in a small outbreak, uh, a facility is doing very well and only needs a little bit of support. Other times facilities have used our resources and have had people on site from Penn almost daily for weeks, which is absolutely fine. You know, I think one of the other challenges during an outbreak is sometimes staff are infected and then they need to be home quarantined, which leaves staffing gaps and makes this all that much more difficult to do. And so we also can work with agencies and even provide financial support to get extra staff into the building when that's needed. You know, more recently, we've been reflecting on other ways we can support our long-term care partners. I think recognizing these staff is really critical. So we're working on ways to do that. Bereavement care and the mental health resources you heard about are something else I think is absolutely essential. And then lastly, we're starting to think about the resident isolation. You know, are there facilities that need iPads or other technology solutions to be able to connect better with loved ones? So we're gonna be spending some time on that in the next month. So overall, um, I think this model of, of a partnership between the health department, the health systems in the city that are dedicated uh, to the health of the residents, and then the long-term care facilities is a really fruitful, fruitful partnership. Um, I do wanna also give the Philadelphia Department of Public Health uh, some recognition. They often join us on our site visits. We speak with them on an almost daily basis and we make sure that we're not duplicating uh, services, that we're not uh, both calling the same facility and overwhelming them, but that we're integrating in our care. So that's been really successful. So in conclusion, I, I wanted to share just a few take homes. First, even though the numbers are very overwhelming, I actually have a lot of hope about how this will go the second time around in long-term care because we've learned so much. And even though there will be outbreaks, when we take this approach of testing very aggressively, understanding who's positive, having all the right services in place, the outbreaks are not getting as large as they were in the spring. And I really think that if we all work together, we can keep the outbreaks contained. We may not avoid all the outbreaks, but we can keep them much smaller. So I think that's really important. 
but we can't let down our guard and our long-term care partners continue to need these tangible resources. They need PPE, they need testing, they need staffing, they need support. Um, they need clinical experts who may have questions who are available just picking up the phone. They really need our support. And then lastly, I would encourage us to think broad when we think about long-term care. I know nursing homes are what we all immediately think of, but there's so many other kinds of facilities in our in our city. There are group homes for individuals with intellectual disabilities. For example, mm -hmm. there are residential drug and alcohol treatment programs. Yes, yes. There are group homes uh, for individuals with autism. And I think we need to include all of those in our umbrella thinking and, and uh, not to take any resources or attention from nursing homes, that's critical, but to also just widen our scope and really make sure we're meeting the needs of all these different types of facilities in our planning. So thank you very much again for this opportunity to testify and I'm happy to take any questions you might have. Thank you. We're going to hold the questions until the uh, end of the panel. Sure. Can we have our next uh, person who is here to testify? If you could state your name for the record and begin your testimony. Um, would that be me? Um, Tom. Uh, Madam uh, Chair. Tom, uh, Thomas Norderman. Yes. You, yes, you can go. You Feel free. Stay your name for the record and proceed okay. with your testimony. My name is Thomas Norderman. N O R D E M A N. And I would like to begin by uh, first thanking uh, the the uh, chair and the rest of the council for giving me the opportunity to testify today. And I'd like to say a few words about who I am and my background so you can better understand my testimony. I am 37 years old, and I live at English House in Valley Kingwood. I have cerebral palsy, and I'm confined to I have lived here at English House since 2003, and the main reason I came to English was because it it was a very active and robust community. Uh, I would say from 10 o'clock to 8 o'clock every night, there's, uh, there was always a variety of um, acts activities that you could do, uh, um, movies, Zumba, um, spirit. If I told you all the activities, we would be here all day. I know you guys don't have that. Um, but I just want to say since COVID, um, we have been isolated. All residents are required to remain in the rooms, which flies in the face of what English is as an organization. And I understand they're doing it for people's safety, but um, I look forward to the day when English will be English once more. The reason I come before the panel uh, today is because I want to recognize our awesome health, our awesome CNAs and our artists that come in every day 
and put their lives on the line every day during this pandemic. And I want to say that they're, they're great, but I also, I also want to say there's not enough of them. And I feel like a lot of our nurses and CNAs are experiencing burnout because a lot of yeah. work double shifts. Um, so I feel that there needs to be some incentives for nurses and uh, health care providers. I feel that um, a wage needs to be increased. I feel that a health care provider, a CNA, should, should have a starting wage of no less than $25 an hour, as opposed to the 15 that uh, the, the starting rate is now. I, because I really feel that it's a demanding job for our CNAs, our healthcare workers, and I, I feel that oftentimes they are underappreciated by um, uh, the upper management as a couple of uh, the witnesses have um, have spoken about and I really feel that we need more help during this pandemic I feel that the ratio of of uh, resident to caregiver needs to be dropped significantly a caregiver should not be responsible for more than three residents. I really feel that time to stop just because of COVID. The earth kept spinning. And so I feel that we need to put these things in place. Now, we need more staffing. Um, more staffing that have adequate help to do the job and do it to the best of their ability. I, I thank you for letting me testify and I, I will just close by saying that I am praying for all of the of you on town, I'm looking forward to the day when there's a vaccine and we're, um, we're finally out of isolation again. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Tom, for your testimony and for being here today. And I agree with you that the rates and the, the rates and the ratio uh, for caregiver to, to uh, patients needs to be adjusted um, significantly. And um, it, it's, what we, it's what you do when you, when you truly care about people. Um, you know, the, the, the job and the pay and the uh, uh, offers, uh, the benefits reflect that uh, if a society has the level of respect that they should have. And I think that we have a long way to go to making sure that that happens. So I thank you, Tom, for your testimony. I did want to note that Dr. O'Connor has a hard stop at 2.30 um, for another meeting. So if anyone had any questions for Dr. O'Connor, we need to get those in now. Councilmember Thomas? I did want to ask a question. 
Yeah. Mm -hmm. So uh, first of all, thank you to all the witnesses. And um, I definitely want to uh, get to time in a little bit. But Dr. O'Connor, before you leave, I did want to um, ask you um, about uh, what your practices were. So if CARES dollars were to dry up, um, similar to what Dr. Farley said, how would that impact the work that you're doing right now? That would really be a challenge. You know, when we were doing this work on a voluntary basis in the spring, we were able to help uh, with some things. You know, we were able to provide uh, PPE we could spare from our hospital system. We provided with uh, consultants and, and support, but to really do this well, it takes, uh, it takes funding. For example, testing an entire building, all of the staff and all the residents, that's hundreds of tests. And we do that in most of the buildings every single week. Um, same thing with emergency staffing. You know, if a facility has uh, 10 staff that are out and we want to put 10 individuals in to make sure that the residents are getting enough care that requires funding. So the program can't continue past December 1st, December 31st without additional funding. We we wish we had staff from the hospitals to be able to just lend to the long-term care facilities, but as everybody knows, the hospital capacity is also really full right now and the labs are busy and, and that sort of thing. So this is really a standalone program um, that we need continued support and funding. And I think we've provided a great value to the city and we really, we feel that commitment we want to continue. So before you leave, um, and I wish we could dive deeper to the conversation, but I know you have to go. Before you leave real quick, what best practices have you found that apply to uh, your work in the nursing homes that we can also apply to the work that we're doing in general as it relates to this new wave of coronaviruses that we've seen and um, the tax ahead of us to flatten the curve? Yeah, so first thing I'd really encourage is testing. That is absolutely the tool that we've been using to keep these outbreaks small and the same thing applies in, in our personal lives. So in a nursing home, if there's one positive case, resident or staff, we test all the residents and all the staff immediately to understand who's positive. And that way we can send staff who are sick home, we can isolate residents who are positive. And I think we all need to have a similar approach to testing and isolation in our personal lives. If we're at a, a gathering and somebody is positive and we learn of that, we need to isolate and we need to get tested. So that's the first thing. Um, the second thing is the long-term care facilities have gotten really good at infection control practices. And some of these are basic things, but rigorous attention to hand hygiene, wearing a mask perfectly all the time. This virus just doesn't give us a lot of room for error. If you take your mask down for a while and you're eating with other individuals and there's coronavirus in the room, people will become infected. So if all of us can be as uh, rigorous with those two things, masking and hand hygiene, as our long-term care partners have gotten, and then if we apply this testing isolation strategy, it would really go a long way. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Councilman. Okay, thank you, thank you, Dr. O'Connor. We really appreciate, really appreciate, appreciate you joining, we appreciate us, you joining today. us today. Thank you very thank much. Very much. Okay, okay, and now if we could have the next, have the next folks who uh, a person who was uh, scheduled to testify i believe we have kathy cubit dr phil mccallion and nancy salandra from liberty resources kathy please state your name for the record and begin with your testimony thank you my name is Kathy Cubitt. I'm the advocacy manager from CARI, the Center for Advocacy for the Rights and Interests of the Elderly. I'd like to thank you, Chairwoman Bass, uh, Council Member Thomas, and the other members of the uh, committee for the opportunity to pr provide CARI's perspective today on why older adults living in congregate care settings have suffered disproportionately during this pandemic. For the for carries a nonprofit organization, we're dedicated to improving the quality of life for frail older adults, regardless of whether they uh, live at home or in a facility. And since 1977, we have worked to promote their well being, rights, and autonomy, and have had the privilege of working with many of your offices. We respond to all types of inquiries, whether housing, to the healthcare issues. And we also work with the Philadelphia Corporation for Aging, 
and center in the park to provide long-term care ombudsman services that advocates for uh, long-term care consumers and uh, CARI represents thousands of residents and nursing facilities, personal care homes, uh, domiciliary care, as well as life and adult day participants in part of Philadelphia and center in the park um, represents folks in, in the other sections. They have Northeast and Northwest Philadelphia. But anyone can call with who has questions or concerns um, can call us at 215-545-5728 or help is uh, free and, and confidential. In Philadelphia, there are 47 nursing facilities and 61 personal care homes. The pandemic has had drastic and tragic effects, as we've heard today, um, on residents and staff who care for them. About almost 6,000 long-term uh, care residents have died because of COVID, um, which represents 68% of all deaths in Pennsylvania. Of the uh, little over 1,900 um, uh, deaths in, reported in Philadelphia, 918 or 48% were um, in long-term care from long-term care facility residents. Um, there are other deaths though that can be attributed to COVID um, such as failure to thrive as we've heard about um, uh, today as well. And, but unfortunately, these types of deaths are not um, being tabulated. There are a multitude of reasons why there's been um, this disproportionate amount of death and, and suffering as we've heard today. At the start of the pandemic, the federal government failed to educate the public about the threat, provide needed testing, distribute um, PPE, or provide other needed supports to long-term care facilities. Our overwhelmed state officials were delayed in making long-term care facilities a, a priority in its COVID response. And as we've also heard today, the pandemic has laid bare long-standing problems that have been neglected for decades in uh, long uh, nursing facilities that related to um, infection control violations and often severe staffing shortages. Contributing to the spread are, are just factors related to the design of congregate um, living, as Dr. O'Connor had mentioned, and when you have multiple residents uh, sharing one room. The physical distancing is particularly challenging, um, especially for folks with um, different cognitive or functional impairment. And residents who have become infected tend to be at high risk for mortality due to multiple chronic conditions. In the worst circumstances, COVID has triggered high levels of physical, mental, and emotional suffering and even needless death. The lives lost have had value. And many of these lives lost would, would have been prevented with proper resources and, and expertise. So we must not only address the COVID crisis, um, but we must also address the conditions, many of which are systemic, that led to, led to these avoidable and tragic outcomes. Carrie and uh, Community Legal Services quickly partnered and we've been advocating for um, uh, policy changes in, in around Pennsylvania's long-term care facilities. And we've written a couple of issue briefs um, and uh, one related specifically to the, uh, the problems with isolation, severe isolation, and another that took a more comprehensive view that includes more than 40 recommendations that are be based on research and based best practices. And uh, the recommendations fall under nine um, categories, many of which we've, we've already heard about today. There's, so there's been some progress as mentioned, but we still need um, more uh, to uh, prevent additional avoidable deaths and suffering. The current exponential rise in COVID cases is troubling for many reasons. Among them is the clear finding um, that higher rates of COVID spread within a community increases the probability of introduction of the virus um, by staff or others entering facilities. 
And while uh, the facilities that we've heard are in a better position to mitigate outbreaks um, than we were earlier on, um, with the infection control and testing of PPE, state officials we've heard um, earlier this week, they're now reporting an average of about 200 new COVID cases in um, Pennsylvania long-term care facilities a day. Um, most of these are in nursing facilities. So residents continue to die as we speak. Um, the newly implemented uh, regional response health co collaboratives, RICS, which um, Dr. O'Connor and Farley spoke of, have been um, a big help um, to facilities in terms of their response and preparedness. But as we've heard, without funding, they will not continue past um, December 31st. Since the authority for licensing, regulations, and oversight of facilities, um, long-term care facilities, falls on the state and federal government, we are aware that you are limited as city council on how you can directly help. But we have a few um, recommendations. We all need to continue to support public education about COVID prevention um, to decrease community spread, especially as COVID fatigue increases. Uh, we appreciate your holding and hope you'll continue to hold public hearings to draw attention to what is happening in long-term care and continue to include the voice of residents like Tom. Because unfortunately, the residents have been left out of the development of COVID-related policies. If possible, advocate with state and federal policymakers to advance um, the recommendations in our issue brief and um, ensure that facility, long-term care facilities uh, be a priority for support and resources. As we've heard, um, the state is trying to seek additional funds for the RICS as well as um, continuing support for the National Guard, um, which needs authorization from um, uh, President Trump. And that is also, that support's also ex expected to expire December 31st. And they've been a key member of the response team. So the, uh, the entire long-term care system needs financial support to survive. Um, we, we're beginning to see and we'll continue to see long-term facilities might start to close. And there are people living in the community that re also rely upon long-term care services. And uh, quite frankly, providers like Adult Day may not survive much longer without financial relief, and, and that would be a major loss um, to support people that needs, need this kind of help. Hoping that um, facilities, especially with the RIC support ending, should be required to develop COVID-19 mitigation plans and and we've sat, heard Dr. Farley and hope, hopefully they could help uh, review or oversee these plans. Um, and so, uh, we need to support and enhance virtual visitation, um, including training residents how to be self-sufficient if possible, but this does not work for all. And we've been advocating for essential caregivers which will allow all residents who wish to identify one or two essential caregivers who can visit in person following the same safety protocols as staff. As mentioned, some residents are dying from social isolation and restrictive safe, um, these safety protocols. So the workforce issues as described predate COVID, but that certainly has worsened during the pandemic. So we encourage support of the workforce as well. And through measures such as Council Members Brooks' public health emergency leave bill, quality care is dependent upon adequate staffing levels along with properly trained and supported staff. And also, there's been problems with COVID-related data, especially what's been coming from the state. And if there's any way that Philadelphia could share um, and identify which long-term care facilities have active COVID cases, this would be a tremendous help to our ombudsman as well as families and, and residents that um, often uh, aren't hearing this important information. So I want to thank you for your concern for the life, health, and well-being of long-term care residents and count on us on any of your efforts to support older Philadelphians. 
Thank you for your attention to this important issue and the opportunity to testify. Thank you. Well, Kathy, thank you. I wanna thank you for your ideas and suggestions and your testimony today it was really insightful. Um, and particularly the idea that Pennsylvania does not inform folks of um, active COVID cases. Um, that's something we definitely need to look into as a committee. And I'll be uh, talking to my uh, colleagues about ways to approach that. So thank you so much uh, for your testimony. Um, Dr. Phil McCallion from Temple University. Hi, um, I'm Philip McCallion. I'm the director of the School of Social Work within the College of Public Health at Temple University. And I'd like to thank uh, Councilwoman Basson and Councilman Thomas for the opportunity to provide testimony on this critical issue as we all continue to respond to the challenges of COVID-19. When I think about the Philadelphia residents in, in congregated settings, I certainly think about nursing home residents, many of whom are 85 and older. They have an average of six chronic conditions and they need assistance with most activities of daily living, such as dressing and bathing. There are also um, older adults in assisted living. Many of them are also in their 80s, have two to three chronic conditions and need assistance with two to three areas of daily living, such as shopping and transportation. And then I also think about adults with intellectual and developmental disabilities um, living in congregated settings who typically have four to six chronic conditions and need assistance with multiple aspects of daily living. When you are older and you have multiple chronic conditions, you're at most at risk for COVID-19. And also when, when you uh, become infected, um, you're most at risk for adverse consequences. But I also think about that when you're dependent upon others for personal care, lack of PPE and poor adherence to safety protocols places you at higher risk. And, but then the other thing again that I think about is that when people who care for you are living in communities with high infection rates and there's a higher risk that staff will inadvertently bring infection into the place where you're living, uh, particularly when those staff members may be asymptomatic yet positive. So I think the lessons of the, the, the first period of COVID-19 are that congregated settings need to be properly resourced with PPE. All staff need to be trained in PPE use. Cleaning schedules must be rigorous and meet all requirements. And regular testing is needed for staff and residents. There must also be an ability to isolate those infected but I think that anything and everything that we can do to reduce infection rates in the communities where staff live will make a critical difference. There's not a lot of research out yet, but there is research that's supporting all of these things. That one of the strongest predictors of cases and outbreaks in nursing homes was the level of infection within the surrounding community. We all have a role to play in reducing infection and death in nursing homes. Um, there are studies in California and West Virginia that find that top rated nursing home facilities were less likely to have COVID-19 cases. What staff do and how they do it is important. Um, there's also a relationship between having staff who are symptomatic and not unsurprisingly, the number of residents with confirmed uh, and are suspected COVID-19. Regular testing is the best way to ensure that exposure is not from positive, from positive individuals who are asymptomatic. As hard as restrictions are, the, the evidence is that they work. Um, looking at across um, all of the states, what was found was that restrictions help to reduce the daily uh, growth rates of COVID-19 deaths and of hospitalizations as difficult as, restri as restrictions like uh, reductions in visiting hours have been, they work to reduce infection and to reduce mortality. Um, but there's, there are other consequences as well that we need to be concerned about. There are reports of symptoms of anxiety and depression, stress and disturbed sleep, and that this is particularly high among people who have limited support available to them, such as from family members, and that includes those who are widowed, those without children or close relatives, or those for whom we've restricted visitation. 
Many of these individuals relied uh, successfully in the past on community and often church-based social participation and engagement. And the loss of that is being felt really hard. Um, there's also fear among many individuals uh, for themselves and for their family members about contracting the virus. And people do talk about a deep sense of isolation and loneliness, particularly due to restrictions placed on visiting. Um, many use phones and, and computers to keep in touch, but too many of the individuals we're talking about don't have access to, um, to, to technology, don't have the needed training, and also the absence of human contact is keenly felt. So I, I, I think that we need to be thinking about more education uh, being needed on COVID-19 um, and how the steps that we're, we're taking are actually helping because sometimes it may feel like that they're not. Um, addressing loneliness and isolation, it, it can be done by supporting more virtual friendly visiting and companionship programs, providing technology and internet access and, de and delivering supportive physical activity, recreational, good nutrition, and conversational programming, which will make a difference for those living in congregated care. There are good evidence-based models of such program available. Greater access is really needed. Uh, and thank you for the opportunity to testify. Thank you so much for your testimony. It's re really, really uh, helpful and insightful. Um, and I'm sure there's gonna be some questions before, at the end of this panel. Um, the last person that we have to testify uh, from Liberty Resources, Nancy Salandra. Sel Nancy Salandra, I'm sorry for messing up your last name, I'm from Liberty you. Resources. Yes, thank you. Thank you for um, allowing me to testify today. So Absolutely. I'm the director of Independent Living Services at Liberty Resources, which is the Center of Independent Living for Philadelphia County. It's been around for 37 years. We're one of 17 centers in the state of Pennsylvania. We're nonprofit self-help advocacy organizations with programs and services for and directed by disabled people. Our mission is to ensure that people of all disabilities have the same civil rights and equal access to every aspect of life in the community as do other members of society. LRI has been providing nursing home transition services for 30 years, moving people back into the community to their homes or to a new home. People in nursing homes are not just seniors, but people with disabilities of all ages. We have spent decades trying to change the institutional bias so more people can live in the community with services if they need them. Somehow we believe people living in nursing homes are not lives worth living, but that is simply not true. They are someone's family, they have loved ones, they can be contributing members of society with abilities, skills, dreams, and life's worth living. For every person that's in a nursing home, that same person is living out in the community. As one of many providers in Philadelphia providing nursing home transition services, we lost six consumers in two months, which had never happened in the 30 years of doing this. We have a list of 59 people uh, just on our nursing home transition list that their ages range from 28 to 75, getting them out of nursing homes. Since the start of COVID, it's been difficult and frustrating time for many months, we've tried working with the state to get people out of nursing homes sooner, to help people do a 30-day therapeutic leave if someone could take them home and if services could be provided from the state, but that is not necessarily the case. To find funding to get people um, from nursing homes into uh, hotels, just like we're doing with the homeless population. We've been working on that for months with the state, not moving very far. There has to be the ability for people to in this dangerous congregate setting to get out if they wanna get out. People have begged to get out and then have died. And that's been devastating for us here at Liberty Resources and across the state. Many nursing homes also have contracts to take people recovering, contracts with the city to take people recovering from COVID and put them into nursing homes. Why they're doing that, they've actually removed people who were on our nursing home transition list and moved them outside of the county and then they can no longer be working with us. And that is not just a problem here, it's a problem across the state and that needs to stop. Some of the things we're trying to work on, because this is the perfect time to do it, is diversion. You don't have the ability to uh, get services in the community in 24, 48 hours. You do have that ability to get in a nursing home in 24, 48 hours. Right now, diversion should happen because admissions are down because people don't want to go into nursing homes. 
Um, so for us, what, what we've been looking at is that Philadelphia, um, three of its counties are in the top 20 nationwide COVID deaths. Philly ranks number six nationally as of September 17th for the amount of deaths in nursing homes. Um, we have another report that our staff did that I can certainly send on of how bad things are. But yes, 50% um, of the people who died in Philadelphia are in nursing homes. We want things to change uh, for our consumers that are on nursing home transition lists to when these um, response teams come in, that people look at people where they're at. And um, for some of our people, they were told on the day that they were moving in COVID patients that they were gonna be leaving that nursing home moving somewhere else. So they really did not have any choice and they had to, to move. Uh, for other people, they found out that day they were moving into COVID patients and they had to put them on the first floor. So this whole thing is devastating. We've been involved, as I said, for 30 years. So people need to understand people move out of nursing homes and need to understand they're on these lists and that they should be um, talked to about what's going on in these nursing homes and uh, work with providers. There's also managed care now also is uh, providers of many uh, majority of people in nursing homes and majority of people on waivers in the community. So they are another partner out there. I can't say that they're necessarily doing all the things we would like to have happen, but they are out there. Um, that's it, if there's any questions. Thank you for your testimony. Um, you know, I, I don't have any questions, but I do have a comment regarding the um, housing. And it just makes me think about, as we talk about the need for housing and, and various housing needs in the city of Philadelphia, that we really just cannot make sure that uh, we, we cannot forget um, that there are people with different abilities who need housing, that we, we, we just really have to uh, make more of a focus and a commitment uh, to uh, folks who are uh, low income who need housing, but also people who have different abil abilities and who need housing as well. So um, thank you for your testimony. Um, do we have questions from the members of council for, the, for this panel? Any questions? Councilman Thomas? Thank you, Councilman Bass. I was getting to, you beat me to it. I didn't have to do that. Uh, I just wanted to thank uh, the panel um, everybody for their expertise, their perspective, and their testimony here today. Um, I think we got a lot of great information, a lot of important insight. Um, there are some things that we, you know, again, that was discussed that we feel like we can act on and kind of push the initiative now. Um, there were other things that I felt like, um, yeah, we're going to have to do some advocacy more than um, actual action items. And so with that being said, um, I know that there was a lot of testimony. I'm just wondering, um, and, and it was this question was answered somewhat, but I'm wondering if anybody wants to give um, us as council members or people in the general public any best practices or, or things that they may not necessarily had an opportunity to communicate. Um, we're talking specifically about uh, nursing homes and um, senior facilities and home care facilities right now. But again, the timing couldn't be, uh, I guess you could say, um, any better or worse. It's looking at the fact that we're, we, we are in the midst of our worst wave right now. So what other advice do you feel like the citizens of Philadelphia should hear? What do we need to know? And, and what are some other best practices? I also um, want to put a special note in whoever made the suggestion that uh, we have education and more education and awareness. Um, I'm the chair of the Disadvantaged Communities Task Force, and um, we did a listening session in the council, the seventh councilmanic district. And I was actually surprised at how many people said, you know, that we need more education sessions around um, not just the virus, but how to wear a mask and, and making sure you wear it the entire time and, you know, just a brief second of taking it off and that could be enough to expose somebody. So anybody who wants to comment that, I appreciate it. And um, again, thank you, Madam Chair, for your leadership on this. Well, this is Kathy from Cary. If I could just take the opportunity to again thank you for this. And if people are interested in um, our issue paper, they can find that on our website at cary.org. And I just want to, everyone's, there's a lot of suffering that's going on right now, yes. especially uh, among residents, but also um, their families um and and members of the community and i just want folks to know that we are here as an advocate and don't go through things alone if you need connections with to mental health services 
um, there, there's, there's um, or any kind of um, conversation that you might need to talk about options or problems, please um, don't hesitate to contact us and also any of your offices if we can help through your constituent services. Just know um, we don't want people going through this uh, alone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Kathy. Uh, I see that Council Member Brooks has a question. Yes, thank you. My question is, um, Rob, I'm not really sure who would be able to answer this, but it's mainly around, someone mentioned the opportunity for transitioning from nursing home into um, independent living or housing um, outside of nursing home. What is the available stock? housing stock look like? I know we talked about lack of low income housing, but I want you to tell us more about low income accessible housing, which is something that we run into when we're trying mm -hmm. to house folks with special needs and some of our elder population. So can you give us some more information about that for the record? Yes. Yeah, so can I, can I, Nancy, before you go, I want to give the, uh, unofficial uh, uh, assessment, which is that's not an, it's, there's not enough. <laughs> but Nancy, if you could give us a, a, you know, which I'm sure Councilwoman that you're already aware of, you already know, but um, uh, Nancy, if you want to go ahead. Uh, the city of Philadelphia does uh, do 10% accessible when they build new housing, which is great. Uh, we have been working on trying to get 13% because our population of people with mobility disabilities is 13% in the Philo city of Philadelphia. You know, we have one of the highest populations of the top 10 cities are disabled people in the city of Philadelphia. So uh, if we could increase that, we also have a uh, basic system repair. Uh, I mean, adaptive bond program, we have a large one, larger than most cities. Uh, so for now, for nursing home transition, it will take anywhere from six months to a year and housing is the biggest issue. So that people are stuck in the facilities waiting for that. We do, there is priority uh, for vouchers for nursing home transition, but they run out really quick. There's also an 811 PRA program, but that's not easy to necessarily access. So um, there's not enough to meet the need. That's why we're just one provider of NHG in Philadelphia and we have 59 people on our list. And that's pretty much all the time. Nancy, for the record, yeah. this was prior to COVID. This was already an issue. Mm -hmm. Always, always. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Um, Nancy, I had a question and it just slipped my mind. So when it comes back around, I'll, um, oh, I know what it was. Um, so um, as, as a housing provider um, or a facilitator to provide housing, do you have conversations, network connections with individual uh, property owners, landlords to help develop additional units? And I'm talking about probably on a smaller scale, not when they're building the great big building and they're adding in, you know, um, 10 units, uh, you know, for out of a hundred unit building, but I'm talking about on a much smaller scale uh, in the neighborhoods, you know, and converting a, a, like a, a three bedroom regular row house, you know, um, into something that's gonna be accessible. And we know that the modifications on that, um, you know, the city can be helpful with. So can you talk about that? Yeah, we have spent years developing that. So one of our staff actually just works on the housing part of that. Um, and has developed relationships with landlords everywhere. So they know to contact us or if they have some thought about how to make something accessible. So we work on that. I sit on the Housing Trust Fund Oversight Board. So I'm always letting them know constantly that this is a huge need and they're aware of what's happening now that uh, we're desperate to get people out of nursing homes. Um, mm -hmm. And they're, you know, um, helpful as far as they can be, but um, Yes, we do work with any landlord and they're aware of us and we reach out constantly everywhere. Well, thank you. And I also want to give a quick shout out to uh, Lisa Jackson, who is my cousin who works there at Liberty Resources. I cannot have a conversation of, on anything with Lisa without having some conversation about Liberty Resources. She's such an advocate and well, has, uh, yeah, and has worked to make sure. And moves people yes, to, to, to move people out of 
uh, nursing homes and into the community, make sure that they've got everything that they need when they move into the community. So you all do a fantastic job and I hear about it all the time. So, <laughs> so thank you. Councilman Thomas, anything else? Thank you, Madam Chair. No, I, I actually don't have any more questions. I just wanted to thank the um, all the panel panelists and participants in today's conversation. I think it's an important one. Um, I'm glad there's a lot more information and facts. I'm pretty sure this was informative to um, all of us as members of council, to uh, other panelists, of course, to the listening audience. Um, I didn't know if there were any uh, other final question or comments from um, any of the panel who are um, still here with us. Um, but I, again, I appreciate this conversation. Um, I think it's really important. And as city leaders, I'm hoping that we can, again, address some of the issues, advocate for other issues and in the midst of this current wave of the coronavirus that we're essentially fighting, put ourselves in a position where we can save as many lives as possible. I know somebody said it before, as far as one of the workers, uh, they said it felt like they were waking up and uh, going to war every day. And I think um, mm -hmm. we have to go back to that mindset of being yes. the virus instead of living with the virus. I think we've kind of transitioned into this phase of life where we're saying, well, we're just going to live with COVID. And that's yeah. very dangerous because the more yeah. of us who decide that we're going to try to live with it, the more of others who uh, consequentially will die because of that decision. Um, so I yes. want to thank everybody for being here today. Um, thank you, Madam Chair, so much. I appreciate it. I look forward to working with you in your office uh, to continue to um, address this issue. And also a special thank you to my staff as well, too, who helped put together um, some of the panels and guests for today's conversation. Thank you, Madam Chair. I appreciate you. Thank you, Councilman. Is there anyone else here who wanted to testify, who did not testify? Okay, seeing none, is there anyone else on the committee who would like to say anything? Okay, Councilman Green. Madam Chair, yeah, I'll just be brief. I just wanna thank all of the panelists um, for providing information on this important topic. This is a, a timely conversation that's so important especially considering what is happening right yeah. now with the increase in uh in infections of the virus and how it's impacting our city especially those who are more vulnerable so thank you council member thomas uh for this hearing this conversation uh and for having this discussion this afternoon thank you councilman and um there being no more comments or no further questions from members of the committee and no other witnesses to testify. Um, and uh, we've already asked that and hearing none, I want to thank all the panels and witnesses for your participation today. We value your opinions and uh, we'll certainly take all of your recommendations to heart. This concludes the business before the Committee on Public Health and Human Services. I wanna thank you all very much for your attendance and uh, wish everyone a safe and happy and healthy weekend please be safe and take the proper precautions uh, against COVID. Thank you very much and everyone be safe. Take care, bye-bye. Thanks Councilmember Bass and Sabrina, we appreciate it.